Good evening, and I guess for some of you, good morning. Welcome to 3CI. Uh, it is such a privilege to be able to be with you wherever that is. Right now, uh, it's 56 Sol Street, but maybe for you, it's in your home. Uh, maybe it's, I hope, around a table with some family and friends. Maybe it's in your car on the way to work on Monday. Wherever you are, um, we're about to go into a time of worship. I, I heard something beautiful this week that said, uh, when you love someone, you learn the song of their heart. And when they forget the tune, you sing it over them. And it reminds me of Zephaniah 3.17, where God sings these joyous songs over us. He rejoices, he rejoices in us and calms our fears. So tonight, if you're in a place where you can rejoice, where you can sing songs of praise and hope and of celebration, fantastic, let's do that. If you're in a place where your heart maybe has forgotten those words or that tune, let the Lord sing over you as we sing together and be reminded that He rejoices in you. So let's worship.
So where, wherever you are watching this or listening to this, whether that's on a podcast or a video, or here uh, on Thursday night or Sunday morning or Monday on the way to work, welcome to church. For us who are sitting here for the woos, um, we're here, right? We're here at 56 Sol Street, and it feels amazing. Um, but thinking about saying welcome to church, that's true wherever you are listening to this. Um, we are the church. Uh, at 3CI, we are a house of refuge. It's one of our values. We're a house of adventure. We're a house of prayer, of worship, of generosity. But we are also a house of refuge, a safe place. Raw and, and many others here, it's, it's, some, it's a phrase we love, is run to the church. When you're in trouble, run to the church. And that's tough. Uh, it's tough during lockdown. You can run here. The build, there, there's staff here. We want more and more people to run here soon. Um, President Ramaphosa, if you're listening, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. But church is happening in so many other places too. Church is happening around dinner tables. You can run there. Uh, church is happening in people's homes. You can run there. You can run to mom's group. Um, that's church. You can run there in times of trouble. You can run to your life group. We're here with our life groups. It's flippin' lacquer. But that's a place to run. Um, because refuge. So I want to encourage you, if, uh, as you're listening to this, it's, if it's a Sunday for you, you can come and run to the church or drive here slowly at a reasonable pace. Um, the church is open Sunday uh, from 9 to 12 for worship and then open again in the evening from 5 to 7 for worship as well. Uh, we will be having satellites uh, now coming Friday, Friday night from 7 o'clock. There is satellite at the church building so you can run or get your parents to drive you and then run once you've gotten out of the car. Um, but now, as we talk about the church, um, I, I am dressed for a podcast, uh, but Stephen is dressed for YouTube, um, and uh, Steve is going to share a word for us tonight. So as Steve comes up, I'm going to quickly pray and say, Father, thank you so much that we can run to the church in times of trouble. Thank you, Lord, that we can run to you, that you are a strong tower. We find our refuge in you. You are the word, and thank you that we get to hear your word tonight. Thanks. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. If I don't see you, good night. <laughs> it's so lucky to be with you. We are working our way through 133, which is the first 133 chapters of the New Testament. And it's hard to believe, but we've already flown through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're nearly at the tail end of Acts, and then we're into Romans, and it's a wrap. I can't believe it. We've just been flying. We've been working with our daily devotional and our Bible reading plan. So I trust that you've been following with us and allowing God's word into your heart as we team together, stand together and listen to God's word together. But if you have your Bible with you, I'd love for you to tap on your favorite Bible app and turn to Acts chapter 17. It should be right at the very top if you ordered the books of your Bible alphabetically on your phone. Sure, tough crowd. Okay. There we go. All right. I'm going to read it for you while, while you avoid that red dot on your Facebook app and you touch the Bible and go to Act 17. It says the following. Uh, just to give you a backdrop, uh, Paul has gone across the Mediterranean Bowl. He's brought back, uh, in, in one sense, stories and testimonies of what God has done. He's uh, refueled and refreshed now. He's being sent out for a second missionary journey, and he's taken some young, fiery men along with him. And what we're going to look at is just some of these key moments that happen as Paul goes back again through uh, these different provinces of Rome. And starting in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Paul and Silas then traveled through the towns of Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, now this is key, this is what Luke is going after, he's taking these little nuggets of Paul's custom. He, he did this and this happened, he did this and this happened. So as was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. He explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. Some of the Jews who were listening were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with many God-fearing Greek men and quite a few prominent women. But some of the Jews were jealous, so they gathered some troublemakers from the marketplace to form a mob and start a riot. They attacked the home of Jason, searching for Paul and Silas so they could drag them out to the crowd. 
Not finding them there, they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers instead and took them before the city council. Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted, and now they are here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason. This is punishable by death. Hey? They are all guilty of treason against Caesar, for they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. Yeah, so fortunately we're a little bit beyond that and we won't be forming mobs and rioting tonight. Um, but I just wanted you to see that for yourself. Line and verse, the, the, the color, the, the fire behind this, because this is just a snippet of what happens while Paul is busy traveling. Let me, let me grab a few nuggets across his missionary journey, the second one. He goes to Philippi, and mob is formed against them. They're dragged out before the authorities. They are stripped, beaten, and thrown in prison sure. on one side. On the other side, there's Lydia, you know, the lady who deals in purple cloth who gets saved, as well as her entire household. There's the slave girl who has a radical encounter with the presence and power of God. There's the Philippian jailer who gets saved, as does his entire household, and they all get baptized. So you got riots and you got revival. City number one. Then they go to Thessalonica. Here, Paul preaches, the Jews are jealous. They form a mob, they start a riot. The city's in turmoil on this side. But over here, it says many Jews believed. So did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. And off they go to Berea. The unbelievers agitate the crowds. They stir them up. They want blood. Call it treason. But on this side, many Jews believed, as did a number of Greek men and women. So they go to Corinth. <laughs> Deja vu. They're opposed. They're insulted. They're assaulted. But the leader of the synagogue... The ground zero, where they're busy trying to assault Paul, the leader of the synagogue and his family give their lives to the Lord. Then they go to Ephesus, and it says some become stubborn, rejecting the gospel, publicly denouncing Christianity, but many believed and were filled with the Holy Spirit. So this was the customary way of Paul and his ministry, it would seem. And then we get to chapter 20. Take a look at this. I want to I actually take these moments, and I want to wrap it in this single verse from chapter 20, verse 1, it says this. When the uproar was over, and all of this was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Sure. Now, it's such a small sure. passing verse, but it is just drenched with oceans of weighty godness in here. And so I just want to make some observations from this tiny little verse for a second before we delve into what this means for us. So he says, when, when the uproar was over, take a look at that word, uproar. So, I mean, this thing has got so many layers in the Greek language. It can be used to describe riots, unrest, lawlessness, turmoil, and chaos. And then it says, on one side we got all of that, and on this side we have believers. So we have riots, and we have revival. We have disruption, and God still brings through new disciples. We have brokenness and there's new believers. There's chaos and there's new Christians. Or in our case, there's lockdown and God is still busy changing lives. So Paul, when the uproar had settled, called for the believers and encouraged them. Now that word, oh, I like this. It's one of my new favorites. I want to explain this word to you. It's the word parakaleo, to encourage. Okay, it, it doesn't mean Paul got them together and said, yo, Yanni. I saw how you pulled up your skirt when the Pharisee pulled up his skirt and he was hauling after you and you outran him. Yeah, you go, boy. It's not that kind of encouragement. It's not, yeah, hey, Bacchus, you know, the way you clap that. Oak. Yeah, you and me together, we're going back into the city. It's not that kind of encouragement. This word parakaleo, to understand it, we kind of got to rewind back to the Gospels where Jesus is busy dealing with his disciples and he says to them, I'm not going to be with you all the time. He's trying to get through to them that they're going to face some stuffs and they're going to face it alone. And he says, but actually, it is better for you that I go. Better for you. Some of the translations say it's to your advantage. I, I, I can't fit that on my, my mental schematics. It's just, it doesn't make sense. It's to your advantage, Jesus says, that I go. Because when I go, I'll pray to the Father and he will send you the parakletos. Helper, our advocate, the Holy Spirit, Parakletos, is the word that Jesus used to describe 
the Holy Spirit, his character, what, is, what he has come to do, okay? Parakletos. Now, to encourage is parakleia. It's the verb form of parakletos. So what Paul is doing here, and, and you need to get this, he says, when the uproar was over, he called the believers together, and he ministered the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit into their lives. Considering what they had faced, what they had seen, what they were going through and were about to go through, he took a hold of their hearts and their hurts, and he brought healing. Such a beautiful little moment that he, t that he took. And it would seem, as Bible scholars say, that that was part of his custom. They would chase him out of the city and he'd sort of sneak back in and take a moment to encourage the believers, to parakaleo with them. Now, why would he do that? To answer that question, I'm going to ask a question. Who here can remember 9-11? Hands up. That's Pete's home groups, all of us, eh? <laughs> Okay, who can remember where you were when you first saw the visuals? Can, can you remember? Can you show of hands? Can you remember who you were? Oh, yeah, I can see it's like you're reliving it. Can you remember the weather? I can remember the weather. Here in Pretoria, it was cloudy, it was murky, almost rainy day. Can you remember, was it a weekday or a weekend? Weekday, yeah. I was at, at work, I was trading forex on the very same New York Stock Exchange while New York was being brought to its knees. I can, I can remember the phone call and the WhatsApp, well, it was pre-WhatsApp dates. The, my mom was trying to get hold of me and tell me what was going on, and I, it just wasn't making sense, and I was trying to look at my trading desk, and, and everything was going wild. And then I can remember getting home with my wife and actually seeing the towers fall for the very first time with our own eyes. I can remember where we were, where our TV was, <laughs> what time of the evening it was. But you know what? That was 20 years ago this month. 20 years ago. And I struggled to find my keys this afternoon. <laughs> Why is that? See, because when we go through something like 9-11, we're not just impacted by it, we're influenced by it. We're not just shaken by it, we are shaped by it. So Paul, when the uproar had settled, he called for the believers and encouraged them because he didn't want those people to be shaped by what their culture was throwing at them. He wanted them to be shaped by the very presence and power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You see, when those towers came down, the crazy thing was just down the road. You might know this guy's name, Tim Keller. You heard of him? So less than five kilometers away, Tim Keller had a church. And he said the following, he said, it was the most heroic moment of the church. I kept thinking to myself, we are born for this. So he was busy giving some feedback. He's pretty much retired from, from leading the church at the moment. And he's just, just doing day-to-day -day ministry online. And they asked him questions about the highlights and lowlights. And he was referring to 9-11. Just, I mean, they could pretty much see the towers fall from where they were. And he said, the church came alive at that time loving on and caring for and serving, getting into the streets, rescuing people, dusting guys off, giving waters, all the way down to getting to the fire stations and praying for the firemen and women, getting to the police stations for months on end, rallying behind these moments. He said it was borderline heroic. But then he made this statement. He said most who rallied after 9-11, who were heroic, we're gone from church in two years. Because in the midst of their heroics, they didn't take time for God to heal their hurt. And somehow knowing this, Paul, when the uproar was over, gathered the believers and parakaleoed. Got into their lives, got into their hearts, lent in with the power of God to heal, to restore, to renew. You know that... They did a survey recently, and they found across the United States, 29% of all the pastors have seriously considered leaving the ministry for good. 29%. Because they are too busy with heroics to find healing for what we are going through. I've been doing a lot of studying around trauma. I've been through a couple of conferences on, on grief. And one of the things that I found interesting, they say the consequences of trauma are never felt in real time. So what that means is, 
What we went through in 2020, the consequences are not felt in 2020. They say instead trauma is not experienced as a memory, but as a reaction. We had a friend over for lunch. I won't mention John's name, but he was just saying he lost his stuffs this past weekend. Apparently, one of the guys in the neighborhood has got these little dogs and goes past his big dogs, but loves to sort of cross the street and let the little dogs really agitate the big dogs. And he said he just had it up to here and he went storming out there. You know, homeowners association, like, you know, red flagged him. Now they're worried about him. It, it's a reaction. And that reaction is irrespective of where you find yourself on the financial curve. It's not because you lost your job, because business is difficult. They are doing extremely well. It's because this trauma is not experienced as a memory, it's experienced as a reaction. And we as a planet of people are reacting. And as Tim Keller said, most who rallied after 9-11 and didn't deal with the grief and loss and trauma they had experienced were gone from church in two years. Sure. Trauma is not a memory, it's a reaction. I want, to, I want to just unpack. I want to give you an opportunity to maybe see some amber lights on your dashboard. So uh, one of the things we, we deal with whenever there's trauma or whenever there's loss, if you sit with someone and planning a funeral, we, we just highlight some of the things that come to the front when it comes to grief, there are four very clear ones. The first one's denial, then it's anger, depression, and bargaining. And we help them just realize you're gonna go through some of the stuff, the stuff that's, that Paul realized they were going through. Denial, have you noticed all the denial? How are you, no, I'm fine. Is everything at work good? Yeah, I'm fine, how's your marriage? Fine, the kid's fine. Yeah. How did you hold up doing homeschooling? No, it's fine, yeah, it's just flat out denial. And guys are the worst, men. Second one, anger. <laughs> we, so my father and I were sort of back and forth because of the you know, hurricane that's made ground in the US. And he's sending me photos and I'm sending him links and we're sort of comparing notes. And so I go on CNN, one of the links he sent me, and you know, you got this, the major headline is just the chaos that uh, Ida is causing the US. But right underneath it was another massive headline a father decided to strip naked at the school's AGM. And he says to them, how can you tell me to put my clothes on, but you're not telling the children to put their masks on? <laughs> Anger. The article just below that, the international global headline on CNN, <laughs> is this poor health and safety officer, I don't know if you saw the picture, hauling it out of the school hall with parents in tow, because he had gone there to tell them to put their masks on. <laughs> so... Damn if you do, damn if you don't, you know. These guys, don't worry about masks. These guys, put your mask on, and it's anger, vitriol. <laughs> we shouldn't be surprised that the Black Lives Matter issue exploded across the globe the way that it did at this time, because we have gone through an uproar. We shouldn't be surprised that we experienced the riots, because there's riots and anger in our hearts. Sure. And Paul when the uproar had settled, called the believers and he did business with their hearts. The other one is depression. I'm not a doctor. Can't quote me on this. You can quote my friend G. Ugal. And he says the following. Some of the symptoms. Any of these yellow on your dashboard? Symptoms of depression. Anxiety. Apathy. I've heard that one. A loss of interest or pleasure in activities. You're just like, uh, mood swings, agitation, social isolation, insomnia, restless sleep, fatigue, whew, just tired, just driving home from work, it's like barely stay awake, lack of concentration, weight gain. I just think that's compassionate eating, if you ask me. <laughs> and I, I raise this because it seems like every second person is mentioning one of those. Maybe you've said it to your spouse recently, or your boss, or you just thought, oh, man, I, I just, when last did I have a good night's sleep? And here's the thing, when the uproar had settled, Paul called the believers and parakaleoed them because we serve the God who takes dirt 
and breathes life into it, and there's Adam. He takes the dirt that is your marriage, the, the dust that is left of your business, and he's able to breathe life into that. He's the God who's able to take a valley of dry bones and give it life and raise an army. He's the God, as Kurt reminded us, who we sing songs about. Waymaker, miracle worker, turns graveyards into gardens. But better than that, he's the God who sings over you and I. And knowing this, when the uproar had settled, Paul called the believers and paracoleoed, encouraged them, poured the presence and the power, and the healing ministry of the Holy Spirit into those hearts. The last one is bargaining, and I will drop this one and run. Bargaining looks like this. You know, I've had such a, insert expletive here, bleep, bleep, bleep day. I deserve an extra glass of wine. Or, you know, I've had such a bleep, bleep, bleep month. I deserve an extramarital affair. And we're in danger, like Esau, giving up our birthrights for a bowl of stew. Bargaining. Because there's so much turmoil underneath rights, pandemonium, lawlessness, unjust treatment, anger, the whole word there around uproar. It's under our hood and we're hiding it. Men, we, oh, we are the worst of the worst. We pack it away, we compartmentalize it, we push it aside, not realizing actually we're just adding the ingredients for C4 and in a moment, what happened to him? Off the rails, marriage down the drain. Did you hear what, the way he spoke to his wife? Why? Because we're just sticking it there, knowing this. When the uproar had settled, Paul called for the believers and he did ministry in those hearts. You know, Rory's been speaking about the dusty road. This is the dusty road. If you watched last week, he spoke about how Peter, when he was confronted with his prejudice against the Gentiles, was then told by the Lord to go to Cornelius' house, 50 kilometers of dirt road. And it's on that dirt road he really had to do some serious business because he was about to cross the line. He was about to go into a Gentile's home. And that was it for him. <laughs> Public ministry down the toilets or lose all his Instagram followers. And he had to make some serious decisions on that dust road. But here's the thing. The dust road wasn't only for him. It was for Cornelius. Or dare I say it was for you and I. Cornelius represented the Gentile, the non-Jew. For everyone in this room who's a non-Jew, that's you. So he walked down. God did work in that heart on that dusty road for us. So this is the second half of this verse that we've been looking at. When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Why? Well, because then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. Cornelius, there was work to do. There were cities to be reached. There were people whose lives needed to be touched. Prayers that needed to be prayed. Moms and dads and kids and, and rhythms that needed the presence of God. You know, you've heard that saying, hurt Hurting people hurt people. Yeah. Healthy people are helpful people. Yeah. And the uproar was over. Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. Then he said goodbye and left for Macedonia. <laughs> so what do we do with this? Well, actually in that self same verse is the encouragement for you and I. Because we are on this side of the scale. If I had to ask you, what have you done with the last 18 months? Not what have you done in the last 18 months, what have you done with the last 18 months? I wonder what the answers we'd give. Probably nothing. We probably just pushed it aside and we were waiting for you know, the presidential announcement. Our hope is in you, Mr. President. But if we don't deal with 2020, it's going to get us yeah, estranged cousin, 2021. And it's going to set up a machine gun nest in 2022, and it's going to mow down all the fruitfulness that comes of that year. It's just going to take you off at your shins, as Tim Keller saw in 9-11. So what do we do? Here's, here's two things, two things from this verse, and then we're done. It says, when the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and parakaleoed them. And he didn't preach to them. 
He didn't send them out two by two. To, you know, we got good momentum, boys. Let's keep going. He, para- he ministered the very presence of God to them. If you're taking notes, the first thing we have to do, 3CR, I urge you to surround yourself with the presence of God. Surround 2020 and whatever is left of 2021 with the presence of God. Surround yourself with that. It should disturb you as it disturbs me. When we open up the building for a recording like this and every single person on that WhatsApp group in the life group comes. But when it's a Tuesday night, it's like five here, six there. (laughs) Black lung, Papa, I can't come. (laughs) It should disturb you. Why? Because did you notice that isolation was part of the signs of depression? There's something amiss there that you are aiming at getting out the door. Avoiding the crowds. Ah, surround yourself with the presence of God. Take all that junk into his presence. You know, Jesus said, it is better for you that I go away. Just just let that marinate a little bit. It means that if you and I were able to invent a time machine to go back and walk those dusty roads of Jerusalem with Jesus, it will be less better then the opportunity that you have right now, closing your eyes and being enveloped by the presence of the living God. That's what he said. Surround yourself with the presence of God. And be honest. Process it. Grieve. Lament. That, that's the reason why we did this series, Megalith, at the very beginning of, of the year. If you missed that, the Megalith books of the Bible are those that deal with death and despair and darkness and grief. And we looked at that, giving handles to how do you process this? How do you do it honestly? How do you grieve? How do you lament? One of the things that I I love doing and I highly recommend it is I love praying the Psalms. Because the Psalms are like the cries of broken people and that God breathed. And if you want to do that, I highly recommend the New Living Translation or the Passion because they're written to really grab a hold of the emotion. So this this is one I've been praying this week. It's from Psalm 35. Oh, Lord, oppose those who oppose me. It's a Bible. I'm allowed to pray that. (laughs) Fight those who fight against me. Put on your armor. Take up your shield. Prepare for battle and come to my aid, Father. Then let sudden ruin come upon them. (laughs) This is God-breathed scripture. This is the travail of David facing a whole bunch of stuffs when that terse payment doesn't get paid out and your boss is dodgy and things aren't working out so like and you're like, Lord, there's injustice here and whatever the case might be, it's like, oh, Lord, oppose those who oppose me. Then I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be glad because he rescues me. With every bone in my body, I will praise him. Lord, who can compare with you? We're nervous of being this honest, but God knows. And you know. But because you don't join the dots, it stays under the hood. It stays buried, just waiting to explode. The second thing, surround yourself with the people of God. You notice there in, uh, in verse 1, it says, When the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers. He didn't send a WhatsApp or have a coffee date or go house to house. He sent, he did a moment like this. Surround yourselves with the people of God. Again, going through Google, 148 studies of 300,000 people on this very topic. And you know what the conclusion is? We're stronger together. Let me, let me just read you some of So stronger social relationships. This means that you are 50%, uh, you stand a 50% greater likelihood of surviving serious health conditions. Just because you mate with mates with Pete. That's what studies show. 50% greater likelihood of surviving serious health conditions. They, they pick up with stronger social relationships, positive changes in your heart, your brain, your hormones, your immune system. They can tell by looking at your stress levels how strong your social relationships are. Stronger social relationships, lower stress levels. Clear. Reduce risk of chronic disease. And on and on. And this is not to mention being surrounded by people who pray for you, who look out for you, pick up the phone and check in on you, who support you, who love on you, make meals for you, are there for you, answering your questions, letting you just dump on them. How much more? Surround yourself 
the presence of God and surround yourself with the people of God. That's exactly what Paul did. When the uproar had ended, called the believers, and he parakaleoed them. I'll end with this. I heard a story that, that just, um, it's like the scripture in living color. A bunch of guys wanted to do just this. They, they realized that they really needed some connection. They, they just needed to blow off some steam. They got together. They prayed together. They had some coffee, laughed and chatted and played some board games. At the end of the night, they were heading on out. So one of the guys said, hey, listen, can I just pray? You know, we sort of make it home before curfew or whatever the case might be. And a quick prayer, just a little, you know, for what we are about to receive, at you go. <laughs> and when they said amen, one of the guys said, listen, I know, I know we're pressed for time, but can I just share something I saw. As I closed my eyes, I saw, saw this guy and God showed me this picture. And he began to tell this guy what he saw. He began essentially to parakaleo in that moment. And this was the picture he saw. He, he referred to the movie Hook. I don't know if you remember the movie Hook. It's about 20, 30 years old. But the basic storyline, it's Captain Hook and Peter Pan. But Peter Pan decides, now he's going to leave Neverland where everyone stays as kids and he's going to grow old and make some money and in doing that, Peter Pan sort of loses his relationship. He's an absent father. He loses uh, on his relationship with his son. His son's name is Jack. Jack loves baseball, and his dad doesn't give a hoot about sport, couldn't care what happens. He never goes to the games. So Captain Hook hears about this and thinks, here's one last jab at his nemesis, Peter Pan. He's going to befriend Peter Pan's son. And so they capture him and... He learns a little bit about this boy. He finds out, hmm, okay, so your dad never went to a single baseball game. So, well, I'm going to let you teach all the pirates how to play baseball. It's based on a true story. Then I'm going to teach all the pirates how to play baseball, and you can be the star, and I will watch every game. So this guy busy telling um, the story. He just said, listen, I saw that moment where Jack, the young boy, steps up to the plate. Captain Hook is there over his shoulder. But his father, Peter Pan, is to hide in the crowd because he doesn't want the pirates to see that he's there. And as he shares that, this guy literally falls to the ground, just breaks, sobbing that ugly cry. And, and everyone's sort of like, oh, okay, we didn't expect that. When he was able to bring himself back together to share what, was, what on earth is going on there, he tells a story. He's an American guy, and he also loved baseball. And his dad also never went to a single baseball game. And then the one afternoon, he said, hey, listen, I'm going to take you to baseball today. And he couldn't believe it. Like, you know, he's like so nervous, like he forgot his mitt and his cap, and he's like, can't wait, Dad is coming to a baseball game. So his dad drives him to the, the diamond, I think it's called, climb out the car, and his dad puts his hand on this boy's shoulders, and he leans in and he says, I can't be your dad anymore. I'm actually going to say goodbye now. So I just brought you here because the boot is full, and I'm going goodbye. And left that young man, nine, ten years old. Now, can you imagine what that does in here? That's, that's what the disciples had gone through. That's what you and I, we've gone through something where it gets in between the cracks, it gets under our skin, and we begin to doubt, God, are you, are you there? Are you really faithful? I, I prayed Psalm 91 two and a half thousand times over my family, and still we got COVID. Where are you, Lord? Because it shapes us. Can you imagine what that does in his social relationships and trusting those who are older than him and the new man in his, mom, in his mom's life? It shapes us. It influences us. But the same thing happened in that moment when he parakaleoed. Just one picture, one word, and the Spirit of God just came and changed his life forever. It will influence who he is as a human being, the way he views his heavenly father, the understanding of scripture that he carries, the, the wife he chooses one day, how he fathers his kids one day, all of that over one moment of parakaleia. And that is what this verse calls us to, to allow God to do that in our lives. But there's something else, and it didn't, didn't get mentioned in the, in the testimony that I heard, that I really felt to share tonight. Jack has now taught all the pirates the game of baseball and how important a home run is. And so now it's the, the climax of the match. The bases are loaded and Jack steps up now to bat. His dad is hiding in the crowd and Captain Hook is cheering him on. And so all the pirates, instead of cheering, 
Home run, Jack. Home run, Jack. They start cheering, run home, Jack. Run home, Jack. Run home, Jack. And I just felt for tonight, if someone, maybe you're online, maybe you're here, maybe you're in the maiden auditorium, God is saying to you, run home, Jack. Run home. It's too dangerous to be distant. Take that hurts, take your heart and let the Holy Spirit parakaleo. I don't know what it is that pushed you away. I don't know what it is that sowed that doubt, that fear. I don't know what it is that led to that despondency and that depression and that anger. I don't know what it is that has come in between you and your wife, your husband or your kids. I don't know what it is that's uprooted your business and started to sink that ship. God's word to you. Run home, Jack. Run home, Jack. Thank you. Yeah. Stephen, that is uh, powerful and beautiful. And um, thank you for the preparation that you put into to listening to the Lord and packaging it in a way that we can process and chew on. Um, I feel like for me, as Steve was preaching tonight, I could see a couple of, of amber lights come up on the dashboard. Um, some red lights too. And my challenge to me, and owning it for myself and for each of us to own it too, to own it at home, um, is to not go, yeah, no, fine. Yeah, lacquer. No, I'm right. Blessed. Great. To not push it away, to not be in denial of those lights that have popped up. A light that maybe you've been seeing in the corner of your eye for a long time. It was amber last week. It's red this week. Um, and to remember that we can parakale, if that's the correct conjugation of the verb, we can parakale with our Father now. We can run to the church. We can stand here and parakale. To go beyond that, like I was saying earlier, to run to mom's group, to run to your mate's spry, to run to a dining room table, to run to the church and speak to someone here. Um, but maybe a friend who you trust or a family member or someone in whom you can find refuge as well, the church, a friend, tell them about one or two of the lights that you've seen on the dashboard. And say, so, hey, I've, I've seen this thing. Can you help? Um, can we parakele about this thing? And the Spirit, the full Holy Spirit is in you and in all of us, and we can parakele. We can run to the church with each other around Briars here tonight on Sunday mornings with family. But don't push those things away. So my challenge is don't ignore the lights. Don't leave this place or this podcast or this YouTube video or this time with family. Take a note, take a moment for yourself and go, you know, maybe now, now I need to address this or pull the car over and write down some notes. And then I challenge you to, to tell someone to run to the church in your spouse or a dear friend or someone in whom you find counsel and ask the Holy Spirit to parakele. I want to pray that that challenge is real for us. Father, for, for us here tonight, for us this morning, listening to this or this evening or on the road, Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, you light up the dashboard and show us, hey, my boy, my girl, this thing, that thing, this thing. That you don't point those things out as criticisms. You don't point those things out as disappointments. You point them out and you say, my boy, my girl, I want to look after this with you. Father, thank you that right now, and in every moment, you want to parakele with us because you want us to be in close, wholesome, healthy relationship with you. As Steve says, hurt people hurt people, healthy people, wholesome people, joyful people. Think of the benefit that we have for others, but first with you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would parakele with each of us. Would you create moments today, this week, perhaps right after listening to this, 
where we can paracolay with one another, where we can just say, hey, bud, I need to talk to you. Can we grab a coffee this week? Or can we grab a coffee this afternoon? Or phone up mom and say, mom, maybe we can paracolay over the phone or over Skype, whatever that might be. But run to the church, even if that's around a bride this week. Jesus, thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us, that you sing these beautiful songs over us, that you paracolay with us. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.